Good morning, welcome to Christ Chapel Online. We're so glad you joined us. I'm Reverend Gerald Walls, the founding pastor of Christ Chapel the Valley, and we're just so glad you're here. We know there's so many options and around for you these days, even in COVID, things to do, so we know your time is valuable, so we appreciate you sharing your time with us this morning. And can you believe that we are in autumn? It happened this last week. Uh, third season of our pandemic, so hopefully we get through this thing soon. Uh, and just to let you know, there have there haven't been any new updates um, from Department of Public Health. We have heard that there is an increase of infections because of the holiday a couple weeks ago or uh, Labor Day. So again, we see that, you know, move forward, hang in there a while. So we're just praying. Keep praying and asking God to direct us, give us wisdom and guidance as we go through this pandemic and just hang in there. We will get through this. God will see us through and everything's going to be fine. So just so you know what's going to happen in our service this morning, we're going to have the music team will minister to us again in song, and they've done another incredible job for us. And then we're going to look at a passage in Mark 8. So if you want to go ahead and start looking there, you can. And afterwards, we will take your prayer request. And I know a lot of you already know our system of how this works, that if you type it into the comments between now and the end of the message, then we have those who will copy those and text those over to me at the end of the service so we can pray together as a church family and we know we're uh, we're two or three agree that that god will work is in our midst and and there are also the idea that as we agree together god will answer so we do want to pray for one another and encourage one another <clears throat> and then we'll have the music team will lead us out in song so as we start the service let's go to the lord in prayer god we're so grateful that you're with us a pandemic can't stop us doesn't stop you. And God, we thank you for technology that allows us to at least have some type of a worship service together, even though it's not the same as gathering. And God, we pray that you help us get through this pandemic, that you give us wisdom and guidance and the patience and forbearance that we need. And Lord, that you just prepare us for whenever we are able to start meeting back together again. And God, we just ask that you minister in the service today, that you touch hearts and lives, and that your Holy Spirit will be in each home, and that you'll tug at each heart, O oh God, and just minister to us those things that we need to just encourage our spirits to lift us up as we go through these days. So God, we invite you through every aspect of the service. We dedicate it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning we will turn it over to the music team as they lead us into a song and I know that we will be blessed by what they have for us today. Oh, 
song and it just ministered to my heart I hope it did yours as well as we just allowed God to speak to us through song and to just prepare our hearts for what God has for us and so again I want to thank the team for guiding us into the throne room of God and um, and we know it's not an easy task what they have to do and there is a difference when you're with uh, people in the room that can help you encourage you in, in what you're doing so they're doing such a great job and for your continued faithfulness and, um, and uh, again, it makes us look forward to the day when we can gather together in person. And it fits so well with our theme this morning that we're made for a, a mission. And too often we think that whenever we talk about a mission, that's for other people. That's for the professional Christians. They take care of the mission. But what we're going to look at is that God is talking to all of us. That uh, when Jesus speaks in this passage, he's telling us that that we, when we're born in this world, we have a purpose and a plan. And we, um, whether we realize it or not, and our task, if we choose to accept it, is to find out what that mission is. And so as we look at today's passage, we're about halfway through the book of Mark. And... Um, as we go through these last chapters, some of them are going to be a little intense. And, and so we've covered different things through the book. We haven't covered everything because then we'd be here for well over a year of going through each of the passages. But I encourage you, read the book of Mark and go along with us. And you'll see there's some times in there where Jesus has done other miracles and of healing and helping people and of taking care of those who have uh, delivered from evil spirits. We did look at where he fed 5,000 people, which was mostly a Jewish crowd. And then we didn't read, do the part, but it's also then shortly after he feeds 4,000 people. And that was Jews and Gentiles, again, showing Jesus' ministry to expand to all people, that there are no exceptions, that there are no disclaimers to any of us. We're all welcome. And so then as we get into chapter 8, we start looking at some of the other things of where Jesus starts preparing his disciples for what's ahead. It's coming to the end of his ministry, and it doesn't make sense to them. Uh, logically, there are parts of Scripture that doesn't make sense to us. We can't fit it together, and that's where faith comes in. And a lot of it is trying to understand, well, what did they understand about science and things at that time as they wrote these things? How does it apply to us? Where does it all fit together? And so we do have to have some faith. But it's in this chapter 2 that we find, uh, chapter 8, uh, that we also find, uh, using two there may sound like the wrong chapter, uh, but it's in chapter 8, that Peter makes his declaration of who Jesus is. And in that passage, he says, you are the Christ. Now, if we would go to the retelling of the story in Matthew, Matthew adds that Peter uh, 
also said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's showing this confession of faith. He knew who Jesus was. And as he is telling Jesus, saying, we understand who you are. We have been following you. We know you are the chosen one, the anointed one. Then Jesus starts to describe to them what's about to happen. That he has his mission. is isn't just to heal people and take care of people's immediate needs. It is for the sake of the world and that he has to go to the cross. And of course, Peter's now confused because that's not how this is supposed to turn out. They knew the scriptures. The scripture was that the Messiah is supposed to rule over Israel. He had always been taught that. So he takes Jesus aside and says, look, this isn't how it's supposed to be. But he neglected the, the understanding or maybe wasn't taught that there were also passages in the Hebrew scriptures that talk about a suffering Messiah. In fact, there are some scholars that felt there would be two, a suffering Messiah and then one who would rule. And as we see the life of Christ, he came first as the suffering servant. He was crucified. But then we believe that he will return again in glory, just fulfilling the whole concept of who the Messiah was to be. But we often don't want those suffering parts. We like the parts of Scripture that are the glory. And, and they were thinking he was going to be exalted to this position of ruler. And that's what they were looking for. So he's telling him, Jesus, this will never happen. Just like many times we don't like subjects that are hard to look at. In fact, a lot of times we ignore those difficult passages. We like the happy clappy stuff. Those are the fun ones. Yay, God, we want that. But sometimes those difficult ones make us look at our heart and at our life and figure out, where do you want me to go, God? How is my life to be directed? So as we see that Peter has proclaimed Jesus the Christ, he then takes Jesus aside to tell him, no, 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 that will never happen to you. As Jesus tells him about his death. And then we get that passage that throws some of us off that just says, get behind me, Satan. Now, he just declared Jesus the Christ, and now he's calling him Satan. And it, we were look, actually looking at this in Bible study right before the pandemic and never really got to get into it any deeper. Uh, hopefully we can do it at another time. But just real briefly, obviously, get behind me is get away from me. I don't need this temptation. I don't need this thought. But when he says Satan, it's like that, that idea that does not come from God. And often we have good ideas, but they're not God ideas. And so those things that, that were being said to him, we will make sure you don't go to the cross. Like, that is not my mission. Get away from me. That's a temptation that I'm sure was there for Jesus throughout. Just when we look at his prayer in Gethsemane, it's the whole thing of saying, get behind me this, this way of thinking that is of the evil one. That needs to stay away from our life is what he's saying. Again, we have to look at these scriptures and when there's things that we read and hear that we don't, don't understand of why is that in there, that's where we have to study and think and look and use context, culture, what was the language, who was the audience, all those things to put it together. And so we can understand Peter not being happy with this because we don't like these things. But then after he tells Peter this, he then gathers the group together, the crowd of those who has gathered after he's had this conversation with Jesus, as Peter and Jesus having this conversation, him saying, get away from me with that thought of idea that's not of God, because I've got my mission and I know what it is and I gotta stay focused on it. Then he calls the crowd together and Mark shows us the crowds are following Jesus everywhere, even when Jesus wants to get time alone. And so as he calls the crowd together, he tells them they've got a mission. Yes, he has a mission, his will be fulfilled, but everyone needs to take up their cross and follow him. So I got a clip here for you that's called Made for Mission, and it just goes along with this, this topic this morning. And the volume's probably gonna be really loud.
I wasn't shaking the camera. That was the artist rendition to get your attention, I guess. But we are made for mission. We all have those things we may not like or want, and often we don't know what that is. It was the same for those who were following Jesus at the time. They had no idea what was to come because obviously with Peter, their idea was he was going to take over Israel, rule and reign in that sense of a Messiah that they had, had thought rather than the suffering servant. So now it's all changing. What does this mean? To think of Christ being crucified costs a serious reaction and a serious response from Jesus. But we know there was a difficult thing for Christ to have to deal with, because I don't know how many of you are old enough to even remember, but in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a movie that came out called The Last Temptation of Christ. It was a long and boring movie, but it's one that uh, the evangelicals got an uproar about, closed down the freeway, I believe, in fact, over it, who had never seen the movie. Um, so out of curiosity, I rented it and checked it out. I think I fell asleep halfway through it. But what I remember the most about it was near the end went, what if Jesus had come off the cross? What if he yielded to that temptation? And it showed then when the, the door opened the world in utter chaos, kind of like what we see today, uh, the utter chaos. But yet, what would have happened had he not gone? We know he didn't want to go. We know this mission was not something that was easy for him. We know that when he was in the garden that he prayed that it be taken from him. So as we look at this passage, we see that that is what is kind of in Jesus' mind of what was to come as we look at where we're going to look in Mark this morning. So we're going to look at Mark 8, 34 through 36, and it says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me. Forever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world but forfeit their soul? So it makes us think and ask, so are we here for what we accumulate, what we can gather to have a comfortable life, to enjoy life? Or are we here for the kingdom of God? Will we follow the example of Christ? Now, these are some tough words, and immediately Jesus is making it clear that the disciples, to be a disciple of Christ, to be a follower of Christ, is more than just signing a membership form or even a confession of faith. It's more than that. Those are both important. We need that confession of faith to start our journey, but a lot of times people stop at that confession of faith. God, we give you the leadership of our life, and then they don't take it any further. They're still in the kingdom of God. That's set and firm and established. But to be a follower, then we have to go those extra steps and have to then say, then what is my mission for the kingdom of God? What has God put within my heart? Membership is important. We need a commitment to a church family that can encourage us and be there for us and support us. And, and we've made our commitment to that body, part of the body of Christ, so that, we, so that body knows who, who's there supporting them and who's helping them along their way with their purpose and mission. Those are important. But are we continuing on to say, Jesus, what do you want in my life? What is my task in this kingdom of God? Now, as Luke tells this story, he adds, it's the, word, adds the word, take up your cross daily. Daily, meaning it isn't a one-time thing. Too often it's like, okay, I've done my task. I've done it. I can move on. It's like, no, daily we have to say, God, what do you want me to do in the kingdom of God today? My life's not my own. Where do you want to take me? And often we, after we've served God for years, we think, well, I've done my time at someone else's turn. But I really feel that until God releases us, we're not free to move on. We may get tired. We may need a break. We need, you know, a temporary time, but no permanent vacations. And when God gives us a different mission, we pray that it's less hectic or takes less physical stamina and that God will bring those up that need to take care of those other roles. We can believe in that, but, but I've always been a sense that as long as we have breath, that God has a purpose and plan for us. And I even got to thinking about my dad with Alzheimer's in a, a care home, and he still had his mission. If he was around a patient that was having some distress, my dad would be right next to the person praying for them before the attendants got there. There were other stories of how he would be just start talking gibberish and when asked, what are you doing? He's like, I'm praying. 
he may not, we may not have understood what he is saying, but I'm sure God did. There's those things that we may not know what our purpose and plan is, but we just daily ask God, what, what do you need of me today? It's so easy to get comfortable with our relationship with God and just say, okay, it's time that I get, you know, me, me, me. And that's kind of where we live in our society. But Jesus is saying, you got to take up your cross. You got to deny yourself. It takes keeping things in that right perspective. And Jesus is telling us that as we follow his example, what did he do? He gave up his life for others. So he's saying that's part of the goal here. You give up your life for others. Hopefully not as dramatic or as painful or as intense as what Jesus had to go through. It's a sense of, will we give our life to follow Christ? Now, most of the disciples we know that followed Jesus were martyrs. Um, we just hope we don't have to get to that place. So these tough words, what he's saying, and he's saying, set yourself aside, set self aside. That's his first instruction. You want to know your mission? Set yourself aside. And we think, well, Jesus, you haven't been around very long. Apparently, you haven't visited the United States lately because we're not about helping others. We are only interested in what our interests are. We only want what we want, how we want it. It's our benefits. And we deserve this privilege because we were born here. And for the sake of others, you really think I'm going to wear a mask for other people? I'm out for number one. I don't care people are dying. I don't care that kids are in cages. I don't care if there's an economic crisis because I'm doing okay. I'm all right. And what she's saying, quit looking at yourself. Set yourself aside, which isn't easy. We are made this way where we want to take care of ourselves. We It's part of survival. In fact, there was a minister, two ministers talking and one stated, to take care of self is the first law of nature. And the older minister stated, to deny self is the first law of grace. Are we willing to deny ourselves? As we understand that we're not here just for our own selves, that we have literally been brought with a price then are we willing to give ourselves to God? First, that comes from 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. You surely know that your body is the temple where the Holy Spirit lives. The Holy Spirit resides within us. The Spirit is in you and is a gift from God. You're no longer your own. God paid a great price for you. So use your body to honor God. How are we using our hands, our feet, our, vo our, feet, our, feet, our voice? in serving others? Are we giving of our time, our talents, our treasures for the purpose of the kingdom? Our natural desires are, well, I don't belong to anybody. I'm, I'm a free person. I'm myself. But yet we'll still go to work and offer our talents and skills so that a corporation gets the money from what we do. We're not our own person. And even if we build to retirement, we're doing that for a while, so we're not our own. But are we willing to say, God, I will do what you want as you lead me? We are to proceed with our mission. And sometimes for us to be able to do what God calls us to do, we need a new attitude. Somebody going to break into song. But we need that new attitude in our heart, and that comes from God as well. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds. That's where the change comes. And to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So it reveals to us that this new attitude starts with our mind. Our mind has to change to accept the fact that we may have to die to self for the sake of others, as Jesus did. Jesus gave of himself for others. And Jesus does understand the agony of doing that. And again, I've referred to it twice already, but when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives to pray as he was getting ready to face the cross, we read his prayer. Luke twenty two forty two. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. That's tough. That's tough. That cup of suffering also has a connection to, to the idea of, of the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah. But 
that is where we had better know what it is God wants us to do because otherwise it's going to be hard for us to put our heart into something that may have struggles and difficulties. And if we make it on our own or just make it about us, then when it gets tough, we're going to say, God, I tried, I just can't do it. But whenever we know that desire is there by God, we've changed our attitude and we're saying, not my will, God, but yours be done. Then it gives us that courage to keep moving forward with a task that may have some difficult situations that come up. That's what true surrender is all about. That is setting ourselves aside. Setting ourselves aside to do what God has instructed us to do. And that may include in our relationships, our jobs, our finances, even where we live. God, I'm not my own. Where do you want me to go? And so after he says, set yourself aside, he says, then also your next step is to take up your cross. Now the cross of Christ was a literal one. Our crosses that we bear will be different. There's a story of a kid who went to Sunday school and whenever the parents picked up the child asked, so what'd you learn today? And said about, about gladly, the cross I bear. A cross I bear? Yeah. We sang, gladly the cross I bear, meaning the cross of Christ. So we can see the kids get confused with our terminology sometimes. But we're not the ones who are out to save the world. Jesus had to do that. Some have a Messiah complex and feel like they are, but we're just required. What mission has God called us to? My cross may not resemble yours. And none of ours are going to resemble Christ. We only need one Messiah. And as we see this story recorded in the three Gospels, and with it repeated, it does indicate this is something you got to realize is going to happen. Each of us have something that we are to do for the kingdom of God. Every committed follower of Christ has a cross allotted, allotted to them. And too often we've, we've turned this term around to where we talk about the cross I must bear as suffering. We call everything a cross. That's not true. Sometimes we are suffering because of what we have to bear, the task that God has called us to do. But sometimes we bring that suffering on ourselves by our own actions and attitudes. So it's hard to say, oh, I've got this cross to bear when we brought it into the situation ourselves. Some of the most people, wicked people we know have sorrows. They can't call it a cross to bear. So for us to connect to a literal cross, we may miss the purpose, the cross we are to bear for Christ was leading us to that point of salvation. The cross we may have to bear is going to be one that is to what is our purpose and mission in life? How will you serve? How will you help? Will you serve to the point of giving yourself totally away as Jesus did? Our cross will bring others into a better understanding of God. And, you know, and through it, it may include some persecutions along the way. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, 19 and 20, God will bless you even if others treat you unfairly for being loyal to him. You don't gain anything by being punished for some wrong you have done, but God will bless you if you suffer for doing something good. So again, we see that there may be times we have to suffer, but again, every cross is not a suffering. And when it talks about that persecution that may come, I got to say, every time I know this comes up and I say it often, but I get so frustrated when that my right is not to bake a cake for someone I disagree with. That's not suffering. That's not religious persecution. You make it for the liar, the greedy, the adulterer, everybody else, and you're trying to say that you're not going to do for a certain person because in your mind that's sinful. It's not about restrictions on us being able to meet together services. Religious persecution, then it's movie persecution because they're not able to meet either. There may be many of us who are harassed though for our faith at different times. And as more and more are giving up their faith, it means we got a bigger job to do it because we're going to have to bring this message of Christ and there may be some ridicule for it. Are we willing to stand if there is pressure? And there will be those who may not even want to associate with you because of the cross, the ministry, the mission God has put on your heart. And I know in my own life, I had people who in the past wouldn't even date me and it wasn't because I was cute, but it was just they didn't want the business of church. Others may not like what you're going through, but that's again where this giving of ourself 
is more than just that experience with Christ to acknowledge Jesus as having leadership of our life. And if that's all you have and want, then you don't have to worry about your eternity. That's, that's established by what Christ has promised. Nothing can take us from his hands. But if you want that closer walk, if you want that following Jesus, that discipleship role, it means there's more that's going to be asked of you. To be a follower means we look for that purpose. We look to ways to make this world better than it is. And too often we've made it about the things we get, the things we possess. And there's nothing wrong with having nice things. God has blessed people with comfortable living, comfortable places. That's great, but why would God give that to you except to help bless others? Yes, you can enjoy the fruits of your labor. You can enjoy all the things that God has given to you. But there's also the blessing that comes from serving and helping others. And for us, we have this new way of thinking. So it may be contrary to some of the things we've been taught about, you know, that happy clappy Christianity but in Colossians 3 1 through 4 it says since you have been raised to new life with Christ set your sights on realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand thinking about the things of heaven not the things of earth and again that helps us fulfill our mission he says for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God and when Christ who is your life is revealed to the whole world you will share in all his glory so again, it's this attitude, this thinking is, the, this world is temporary. Yes, you can be blessed in it. Yes, you can enjoy the things in it, but also include what is it that you can do to serve others and help others? Am I following the ways of Christ and allowing his love and compassion to flow from my life? Oswald Chambers wrote on August 5th, he said, if you are in fellowship with God and recognize that he's taken us into his purpose, then we will no longer strive to find out what his purposes are. As we grow in the Christian life, it becomes simpler to us because we are less inclined to say, I wonder why God allowed this or that. And we begin to see that the compelling purpose of God lies behind everything in life and that God is divinely shaping us into oneness with that purpose. That purpose, offer ourselves to God and others. So he's told us first, we set aside our life, we take up whatever this mission is, this cross that we are to bear and we realize it is, and then we follow Christ. This is important too. You can't, because people have gotten led astray by they're taking up their, their passion, their mission, but they haven't continued to follow Christ. And he says, and follow me. Keep Christ as the center of it all. There's the purpose. That's the purpose of why we do all that we do. It means that we follow in his footsteps. Where is God leading us? Because as God leads us, it draws us into a place we need to be. As I, as I think about my life and I think of the coincidences that happened that got me where I am, I realized, God, it was just following what you wanted. It's not always easy, but you got me where I need to be. We're not able to get in this step effectively if we're still out for our own self and our own desires. So it's important then as we follow Christ, as to, to do as he said, follow him. And when we think of those words, follow me, those are the first words Peter heard. Here he is halfway through the ministry with Jesus. He hears the words, follow me again. And the last recorded words that Jesus spoke to Peter was, follow me. Seems that's something important. For it to be said to this amazing man of God three different times that sometimes we need to re be reminded, don't follow your own path. Follow me. What does God want in your life? Jesus always want, was uh, always in constant obedience to God, and he was willing to do whatever was needed at all costs. And we saw even when it was against Jesus' own will. And that requires a lot of us to be such a vessel. But it takes that willingness of heart. And I know there's those who say, well, there's nothing. I mean, I'm still got this sinful ways. I'm still not all being perfect. God doesn't want you to be perfect. God can work with a willing heart much easier than he can to one who thinks they're already perfect, that they got it all together. I mean, just look at the characters in Scripture. They, none of them show anything about perfection in their own life. God led them to a place of being holy and righteous. David, a man after God's own heart, who had all kinds of imperfections in his life. It's that willing heart that we pick up our cross and follow him. Doesn't mean we're going to do it always, always do it right, but our intentions are to follow Christ. 
And as we see from our text, as we give our life to God, he gives it back to us and it will be an abundant life. We won't lose out. We don't know when. We don't know how. We just trust that God will do as he has promised. And yeah, it can feel like a burden sometimes. It can feel like a heavy weight to follow Christ. But it's that sense of knowing that we keep our eyes on heavenly things, not on earthly things. We just stay in step with God. And often when we come up with a great idea and plan, we may think that's what God wants to do. And it could be. And that's where when these ideas come, we have to present it to God and say, God, is this what you desire? You open the doors and then that's how you follow. You open the doors, you close the doors, you show me what needs to happen. And I know sometimes we struggle with what God wants in our life and that's part of our walk of faith. That challenge to know what is it that God has asked each of us to do for his kingdom. But we have this promise in John 10, 27 and 28. My sheep know my voice and I know them. They follow me and I give them eternal life. So they will never be lost. No one can snatch them out of my hand. I love this verse because it just lets us know that as we follow, we will learn his voice. We'll start learning to hear it. And yeah, there may be times that a door has to slam in our face for we realize, oh, we didn't hear that one. But there are those times that we hear his small, that still small voice within ourselves and we know what it is we're supposed to do. And that last line, nothing, as we follow God, nothing can take us away from him. Not even other Christians who try to say you don't belong. And too often we do tend to compare ourselves with others and we want our path to be like their path. Our path may not be theirs. It'd be great, I think, sometimes if others had that same path I have, because then I could slack off a little bit. But then if I did, then where would all the other tasks come in to help our church grow and develop and our ministry to happen into our world? It takes all of us, different roles, different purposes, and no role is more important than another. We are all in this, taking up that cross, that mission for the sake of Christ. In fact, we're told in 1 Corinthians, there are different spiritual gifts. The same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, yet the Lord, the same Lord is served. There are different types of works to do, but the same God produces every gift in every person. The evidence of the Spirit's presence is given to each person for the common good of everyone. Why do we have these gifts? We can easily go back for me, 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 me. And he said, no, for the common good of everyone. We share those gifts and talents. And then on down in verse 11, there's only one spirit who does all these things by giving what God wants to give to each person. See, it's God who declares who does what in the kingdom of God. That's why we have to get in step. That's why we have to follow him. That's why we have to listen to his voice. And that Holy Spirit, though, is there to empower us. See, that's the great thing. We're not in this alone. Not only are we following Jesus' steps, he's there with us, but we're told the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us and makes us capable to do some of these things like, I can't go there, God. I can't do that, God. And the Holy Spirit's like, I'm here with you. I'll walk you through it. So I got a story of, of a young woman named Crystal Clapp who gave up all that she had to follow Christ. And we see the joy of her being able to say, I give up myself, I take up my cross, and I follow you. Why the Philippines, God? <laughs> Honestly, it is from the Lord. I, I have asked God the same thing. Why the Philippines, Lord? God has given me a huge desire for orphans and for street children. These street children have no one. They live on the streets and they are rejected by often their own family, society. They're considered trash. And the Lord has spoken to me the verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, you know, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you a future, and to give you a hope. Um, that's the theme verse. Um, I feel like what God wants me to tell these children that they are loved, and they are valued, and that they have a hope. Every time I talk about Jesus, their faces just light up, and they want to know who he is, and more about the hope that is found in him. The Great Commission, as it says, go and make disciples of all nations. It's not just going, it's not just telling them one day who Jesus is, but it's being a part of their lives, and discipling them, teaching them about God's word and what it means, and then being an active part of their life and being an example for them to follow. 
The body of Christ is huge to me. I believe without their prayers and without their support and encouragement, I wouldn't be able to do what God has called me to do. In Timothy, it says, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but he's given me a spirit of power and love and self-control. And I always submit these fears to God, and you know, I just trust him that he's called me, he's gonna, He's sending me there, he's going to, um, you know, he's going to equip me and use me mightily for his glory. Jesus Christ means everything to me. Uh, when I think of his sweet name, it reminds me of redemption and restoration and love and of mercy and of grace and just his name that is above all names. It empowers me to do great things for His glory. When I think of Him, I just think of the hope that I have found in Him. I think of what He's done in my life, and I know what He can do in other people's life. There's no sweeter name than Jesus. So Crystal found her mission, her purpose in life, and God helped her carry it out with the help of her church family. And so we may not always understand why God puts us in places that God has, but we trust it is for the purpose of the kingdom of God. So may we seek our hearts to see where it may be that, that we're being asked to follow Jesus. We ask the Holy Spirit, open up those doors, give us direction, give us guidance that we need so we follow you as we should. And yeah, this is one of those tough passages that would be easy to just pass over and say, let's not talk about this stuff. But as followers of Christ, if we want to take those next steps with him more than just saying, okay, I'm in the kingdom, that's all that matters, we have to look at what is it to be a true follower? What does it take? Jesus was preparing his followers for what was ahead for him. And then also preparing them to start thinking about, you're going to have to carry this mission when I'm no longer present. When I have ascended to the Father and sent the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to carry this on. And so here we are 2,000 years later, and thankfully we have that Spirit of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit to help us, to lead us, and guide us. But he's asking us, follow my example, that it takes giving up ourselves for others, of what we think we're entitled to, so that we, you know, can, we, we don't want to set those things aside but we have to start looking around. How can we help? Are we seeing the world as sheep without a shepherd? Are we having a heart of compassion for those who are hurting and suffering and need support? Are we looking around to see what Christ, cross Christ may be asking us to bear? No, it's not all about suffering, but about serving. What is tugging at your heart? What are those things that you just kind of think, oh, I wish I could do this or that? Then, Start seeking God, and if it's going to require others to help, just know that God will continue to open up those doors as that comes about. And yeah, I'm not saying there won't be some heartache and suffering. Most likely there is. All of life has that. But we know that there's a joy of fulfilling what God has called us in, to do in our life. Even Jesus said, for the joy set before me, he endured the cross. Will you respond when Jesus says, follow me? Even though we don't know where that may be. Those were the words Peter heard three different times that we know from Jesus while he is on the planet. And we hear them too, follow me. Will we say yes? Will we allow the Holy Spirit to stir up those gifts and those talents to serve others and be an example of Christ to the world? And may Crystal's story inspire you to also think of ways that God may be directing you and leading you. We are all here for a mission. And our task, if we choose to accept it, is to seek it and find it and fulfill it and know that even if it's impossible with God all things are possible let's pray God we thank you that these tough passages make us do some soul searching and realizing it's not just about the the happy times and the joyous times but there are things you ask of us that you ask us to help with the mission you've put in this world and and God, I believe we all have been given a mission, that there is something that we're all to do for the kingdom of God that will require setting aside ourselves and taking up that, that cross, that idea, that passion for you. And God, most importantly, that we follow you in the process and not our own steps. So God, I ask that as you deal with people's hearts and lives, that you, you start stirring up those things in their own heart, that 
that you give them ideas and especially during this time of COVID that maybe it gives them time to work out an action plan or think about the possibilities of what could be in the next few months when things start opening up again. God, maybe it is a time of this COVID time for just refreshing and a restoration of that desire to again serve and to get back into those areas of service that not, they've not been able to do. God, I ask your Holy Spirit, just minister to hearts and lives and encourage them, O oh God, and help us, O oh Lord, to follow you every step of the way. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So do you have a few prayer requests this morning? So if you'll, um, one is for Christine's sister's mother-in-law who's in the hospital battling COVID and pneumonia. So let's pray, uh, pray for um for Christine's sister's mother-in-law. God, we ask that um, you minister to her health, her strength, guide her, O oh Lord, and just provide the, the services that she needs and for healing in her body. Lord, we just ask that you minister to her in the name of Jesus and be with the family, O oh God, the, the, uh, her son and uh, Christine's sister, O oh Lord, as they um, deal with this uh, situation so close to home that you protect them and guide them and help them as well. And God, even from uh, also for my aunt and uh, my cousin's husband who also has COVID, Lord, that you be with them and that you give them their body strength and healing and wholeness. And we've asked for prayer for Jackie's cousin, Jackie's cousin, Robin's family, uh, after, uh, oh, okay, I guess Robin passed away last night. Okay, so let's pray for Jackie's family. Lord, we, we know that, that loss is always difficult. And God, I just ask that you uh, bring comfort and peace. And again, this family's being hit with a loss. We ask, oh Lord, that you minister to them, oh God, and just uh, Bring that sense of, of peace and assurance that only you can give. And Don's asking for a prayer for very special, important intention. Um, God, you know what that is, Lord. We just ask that that you work in her in Donna's life. You know what's out, what she's requesting. And Lord, we ask that you give guidance and direction and wisdom, that you open doors, that you shut doors. God, that you just minister to Donna's heart in life oh god and then for uh, patricia mary's sister we need to keep her in prayer god we know patricia's uh, struggling with uh, with sickness and illness oh god we and has for a long time oh lord we ask that you be with her bring healing and wholeness to her body lord and minister to her father god in the name of jesus and uh, i think that's all a request. God, you, those are the ones that were presented to us, O oh Lord. And God, I just pray that you help us to remember one another and encourage one another and pray for one another throughout this whole pandemic, God, that, that our church family will be there to support and encourage each other. And God, for other requests that weren't made public, we just ask, O oh Lord, that you again minister to each heart, each life, bring healing, bring provision bring protection. God, we all need safety from this pandemic, oh God. Lord, just a hedge of protection around your people. And we thank you, oh God, for what you're doing in, in our congregation, Lord, that despite not being together, that we know that you are still holding us together and preparing us for that day when we can minister for you in a, again in our church home. So God, we just ask your blessing on all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we do have Bible study on Wednesday night. So uh, we're in the book of Romans. So you, uh, feel free to jump in at any time. If you missed the first part, you can catch up. We're actually, if you come in now, you're getting to the good part because Paul has just told us how we are all desperate need of a, of a savior and we're all a mess. So he's gonna now introduce us to how we get out of this mess. So you may wanna join us for that this week. Uh, we are doing the church family chat on Friday night at 7.30, so I encourage you to, to just spend a little time with your church family. We get to socialize, get to catch up with each other, and if you stay for a short time or a lengthy time, that uh, doesn't matter. We just want you to be a part of that. And then also next Sunday is Communion Sunday again, so um, we will be having communion together, so grab whatever you can find for the elements, get those prepared. Uh, whether it's a wafer or a cracker or bread, pita, tortilla, whatever it may be, or juice, water, or wine, and we'll partake together at the end of service next week. 
And then also, uh, we still need the, your support to keep this ministry going and because and we're looking for the future beyond COVID. So if you can help us and support our, our purpose to help us reach those with God's grace, love, and acceptance, then we ask for your support and help with that. And um, just so you're also aware where we are with the building, we have made an offer. There's five offers on the table. So at this point, it's in God's hands. We're praying if this is where you want us to be, then allow it to go through. If not, then we, um, we're we fine with it. Look, Keep looking. So again, just make it a matter of prayer. And again, with that, if you want to support us with the building fund, because there's always added expenses that we never consider or know they come in last minute with these things or as we're preparing a new home so you can make a donation and dedicate it to the building fund if you would like so we encourage that as well i believe that is all of our announcements so uh, at this time we will turn this back over to our wonderful music team as they sing us out with a song flawless
Praise God. Thank you again, music team, for all your hard work on that. And I'm so tempted here to break into song, but they work so hard on that. I wouldn't want to ruin it. So anyway, I hope you joined in singing, though, and was able to, to just worship and celebrate as we go out into our world and find that mission. Find out what it is that God has for your life. Ask God to open up the doors and follow him wherever God leads you. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we will see you Wednesday night, uh, Friday night discussion group, and next Sunday morning. God bless you. Thank you for being here.